recorded. Well, my goodness, welcome you Zoomers. Welcome Zoomers to the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum, South Rockland's finest maritime museum. Well, isn't that true? Oh my God, it's terrific. It's an amazing, amazing museum here on the south end of Rockland. Certainly is the finest one around. And uh, we are a five-star museum on TripAdvisor. My wife and I started, this is my wife here, alongside me here. She keeps her eye on me to see that, that I do everything right. She and I started this museum 15, 16 years ago. And uh, I always thought, gee, it'll be great to have a maritime museum. It was my career. I own four of the biggest schooners on the coast here. And uh, it'd be great to have a museum. I put my feet up on the desk and I can lie and brag to everybody. And I'm the oldest thing around. They have to believe me. So what else? It seems though it would be a great thing to do. Well, it didn't seem to work out that way. This museum has grown exponentially, my gosh. It has grown so quickly and so fast now. I'm on the dead run all the time trying to keep up with everything. And we have a wonderful program for us tonight. We have a great day, great program going. You, can you realize this is the 27th captain's quarters that we've done? All of these captain's quarters, all of these captains down here in the lower right-hand side. The, of course, it's wintertime in Maine. You see they're all decked out in their finest captain's finery there. But uh, they're all sea captains, every one of them. And all of their vessels we've done Zoom programs on. So if you want any of the history of uh, the schooner fleet out of mid-coast Maine here, or a lot of other things, you know, tugboats and freight boats and all different kind of boats, click into uh, our website and look up the captain's quarters. And uh, they'll tell you all about the, about the history of these vessels, tell you all about what's going on in the local area in the way of the maritime. Well, tonight we certainly have an amazing program coming up for you. We have uh, Elliot Porter and uh, his Co cohort partner in crime, his mate, Brian Manahan. They're going to be doing a program on uh, weather, the water, and life on ships. And this guy has been around all of those things. Everybody talks about the weather. Nobody does anything about it. But Elliot Rappaport does. He not only psychs out the weather, but he reads what it's going, what's going to happen. And uh, he, I think he probably knows before the weatherman what's going to happen. And uh, it's going to be an exciting program. He can describe a hurricane. He can describe uh, uh, the kind of thing at sea that you'd never want to see and uh, do it with such vehemence and so, uh, so much expression. Uh, you'll forget about buying a boat and you'll buy a farm in, a, in Arizona somewhere. But uh, it's really going to be an exciting tale. But before we get into that, I'm sorry, but you got to sit through the commercial. Don't touch that dial. I got to tell you a little bit more about the fantastic Sail Power Steam Museum. And here's our old mu museum here. <clears throat> right in the front of this, you can see this, this crazy looking thing looks like a pizza oven. Actually, it's a kiln. It's a lime kiln. We burn lime there. And uh, as a demonstration, of course, lime, the lime industry built the city of Rockland back in those days. We have a, a big display of the lime industry in the main part of the museum. It is a fascinating museum. These buildings are all filled up. My gosh, this building over here, this is our steam house. We have 12 running steam engines there, actually running and performing for different groups that we have come in to see it. We have our dynamite patient uh, channelry over on this side. Wonderful building filled to the brim with all kinds of paraphernalia for schooners and sloops and sailing vessels and all that kind of thing. And the kind of thing that they would sell years ago in the channelries to all of these vessels coming in and out of Rockland. Rockland, of course, as you probably know, as I've bragged about before, Rockland was the fourth largest seaport back in the late 1800s, fourth largest seaport in the United States, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and Rockland, Maine. You wouldn't believe it, but the shipping, sailing vessels in and out of Rockland were absolutely astounding. And that's what we dwell on here at the, the fantastic museum. Over on the uh, right-hand side of that picture, there's a little hurricane outward, outward bound boat there and a greenery. There's a little green pasture over there. Well, with this building filling up so, we had to do something more drastic with that green than to actually have grass there that we had to mow. We decided we'd put a schooner there. So we did. We got a 68-foot schooner, and we put her there. You can go aboard it. You can sit by the wheel and have your picture taken. Beautiful big schooner. 
give you the feeling of what it's like to be aboard a schooner without getting seasick. Over on the green part of that grass, we decided we'd have to have a new building. We have to have more space. So here's our new building right here. My God, what an incredible building. We put it up a couple of years ago. You can see the, the schooner. This is the winter time. Of course, you can see the schooner over here covered over uh, for the winter. And there's the last rose of summer on the rose bushes in front. Inside that building, of course, you have our main entrance there and these big doors. We have boats inside the building. We have a, a 25 foot steam propelled launch in there. Great, big, beautiful. But we have uh, the light horseman uh, that discovered Penobscot Bay in 1605. We have a couple of Harrishoff 12 and a half. We have all beetle cats. We have all kinds of different boats, antique boats in there on display. It is a beautiful building. We're so excited about it. We're so excited about everything we have in the museum down here in the lower left. <clears throat> Just for an example, one little item, that backstaff, if you know what a backstaff is, people that have studied navigation, every captain in the world, they know the name Nathaniel Bowditch. Nathaniel Bowditch was the father of navigation. And this particular backstaff was his own personal original backstaff. It is engraved to the Bowditch family, 1701. My God, that's a, it's an absolute treasure. Here we have an astrolabe and a theodolite and all kinds of fantastic things to see, but that's just one treasure of the many, many treasures we have in this incredible museum. Let's move ahead here. One of the things that I get so excited about is our SCIF program, SKFF, Sale Kids for Free. This is a marvelous, marvelous program. My God, we decided we wanted to do something in the educational vein. A couple of years ago, we decided we would start a sailing school for people. And one of our board members, Bob Williams, he said, you know, you really ought to offer it to kids and you ought to do it for free. And you'll get a whole lot more mileage out of it doing it for free than by charging for it. So instead of that, we decided we would do it for free. That would be so fantastic. So we took kids eight to 14 years old and we give them a whole week long sail training session. L look at these kids over here on the left. Look at this little kid right there. My God, he's eight years old. And there he is. They're learning to set the sail. They're learning what a center board is, learning what a rudder is, and learning all about these little boats. One kid to a boat. These are only six feet long. <clears throat> so they have to grab the tiller. They have to throw their telephone in a drawer back in the shop and go out there and learn how to sail. And they do. By the middle of the week, they're turning the boats over, writing them up again. By the latter part of the week, they are really out there racing around the buoys and uh, uh, they, they, they're buddies in the next boat. And of course they sail together. They run into each other if they have to. And look at the smile on this kid down there in the lower right. He is just having a ball. These kids learn. They soak it up like a sponge, and by the end of the week, they are actually sailing around the buoys, racing each other, just as you see in the bottom picture right there. Let me tell you a little bit more. What's what else is happening? <clears throat> we have so many different things happening here at the Sail Power Steam Museum. <clears throat> Sail the classic. You can rent a boat. We have two friendship slopes, two Harrishoff twelve and a halves. Uh, two Beetle Cats, the 1920s Beetle Cats, and a whole fleet of other different variety of boats. We have a 420. We have a, 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 well, now there you go. When you get this old, you lose it. But we have a whole pile of boats. Look at all these boats out here sailing around. That's the way it looks at the front of the museum on a good, a good day for sailing. Up in the upper right there, that's our steamboat. That's the steamboat that now is in the new building, our steam launch wonderful wood-burning, uh, bona fide steam launch. Down at the bottom, look at our tent. This is our tent right down on the waterfront there. We build a fire on the beach down there, and you can cook hot dogs, and we cook lobsters. We rent it out, rent the tent out, and we can take a group of 170 people and feed them a lobster lunch. And uh, it's a fantastic thing. We do it for the cruise ships. It's a fantastic thing. It's a great, great thing to share. Our heritage tours tell about lobsters, how they're caught, tell about lobster boats, how they fish for them. And, of course, the Friendship Sloop was the original lobster boat on the coast of Maine. Look over here on the left. There they are. Everybody's gobbling down lobsters just as tight as they can do it. Fantastic. The way, amazing. How, how do you eat lobster with a smile on your face? But they do it. They do it 
every week, all summer long. People bring us things, bring us all kinds of incredible things for our museum. And, of course, this center picture up here, that's the kids out there racing around the buoys out there. All these kids learning how to sail, and which is, it gives me warm, fuzzy feelings all over to see them become real sailors. Over on the left is our one of our friendship sloops, the Persistence. She's an original Wilbur Morse design. And over on the right there, there's grandfather teaching his grandson how to sail in one of our little cat boats down below in the morning in Maine, a beautiful 65 foot catch, a uh, peat colored catch, traditional boat. We take people out on two hour sails in Lock Rockland Harbor. We give you two or three lighthouses for the, the, the two hour sail. And uh, Tyler Waterman, he's our captain board there, very gregarious kind of guy. He's a biologist and, and he, T tells you all about the well flora and fauna all around on the coast of Maine. Wonderful thing to put in your bucket list. You got to do that. Over on the lower left is our marina. We always have schooners and skiffs and all kinds of boats. To, well, all things, kind of things going on. It's really absolutely incredible. But of course, you know, we can't do it without you. We welcome any donations, especially to the skiff program. Any donations you can give, we certainly would thank you, and we couldn't do it without you. So enough of this fall to all now. Let's get to the meat of the conversation here, the meat of the evening. Elliot Rappenport and his cohort, Captain Brian Manahan. He, uh, Brian, I guess, was the mate for Elliot, and he's going to come in and uh, perhaps fill in a few gaps and uh, tell us all about the, well, meteorological and uh, all kinds of seamanship going. So we're going to go ahead and share screens here now. It's up to you guys. Um, I'm going to bail out and uh, Elliot, see if you can come in and fill in the blanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks you very much. Um, I, I think it's really just my job this evening to introduce Elliot. Um, I've known him since 1991. We first met crossing the Atlantic on, uh, yeah, on the, on the schooner Westward, um, owned by SEA, and I've known him for a long time as a captain, a sailor, a teacher, a friend, and most recently a writer. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of background on Elliot. Um, he started on Mary, or I know his, I know his earliest professional job as that on Mary Day as either a deckhand or a mate all the way back in the late 80s or the early 90s. Um, and then I I met him while well, he sailed on the schooner Bowden uh, for MMA as both a mate and a captain from around 1992 until 2002 or 2003. Uh, he sailed with SEA on the Westward and the Siemens uh, and the Kramer for nearly 20 years from uh, ending just in 2020, I think, when he came back to Maine Maritime Academy, um, mostly as a professor, no longer to sail on the Bowdoin, although perhaps occasionally, but now um, as a teacher of seamanship, of navigation, of meteorology, and of a, a class I know that he really enjoys, which is a bridge leadership class. Um, I think I I sailed with them both on the Westward and the Bowden and and had um, such a great time because I I think I I know him best as someone who can explain incredibly complex things in beautifully simple ways that even I can understand um, whether that was the pressure systems of weather or stability um, he's uh, as a I make my living now as a teacher so I have a great deal of respect for the way he was always able to take uh, pretty complex ideas and abstract ideas and explain things that we couldn't necessarily see like isobars and make all of that make sense, at least to me. Um, so it, it's for that that I've had a great deal of appreciation. Um, and I remember, I think, best sitting in the aft cabin of uh, the Bowden pouring over weather maps, trying to figure out which way the systems were going to go as we made made Bowden's way up to Labrador and even to Greenland. Um, so reading his book was a little bit like getting to sit down and listen to him all over again for a couple of hours. Um, 
and the jokes were were even the jokes in the book were even about as good as they were in the aft cabin 20 30 years ago um so elliot thanks for a great book and thanks for having us for a great evening and we'll i'll save the rest of the questions for for the end all right well thanks so much brian and uh thank you jim and robin and thanks to the museum for this invitation and you know, i have to say uh you know, I was, I've heard so much about the museum, of course, because you've been busy, like, you know, driving boats and, you know, wasting time and skiing at Sugarloaf and doing all the projects. Too busy to get to the museum. I was really excited for this chance. So, of course, I, I jumped at the offer and then come to find out Jim is, in fact, in Florida, um, you know, like a wise person for, for February and March. And so, um, but maybe next time it's renewed my excitement to come down to Rockland and um, perhaps meet up with Brian for a pint and, and go to see the museum. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's a pretty good representation of my career. I spent most of it, uh, you know, working at sea on uh, primarily on, on sail training ships, traditionally rigged vessels um, and uh, oceanographic research ships, uh, sometimes both at the same time. And uh, yeah, for the last few years, I've been primarily engaged teaching ashore at Maine Maritime Academy with uh, still a few opportunities to go to sea. And um, I, uh, I started most of my presentations with this slide uh, because it indicates, you know, we have a picture of the... Uh, or with Kramer, uh, one of the great uh, sailing ships of the Sea Education Association in, in Woods Hole. But then, you know, examples of sort of several of the other different ways you can uh, you can go to sea as a professional mariner, just sort of scratching the surface. And then I got this number down in the lower left hand corner that I like to put there. It's like 11 billion tons. You know, what does that what does that mean? And kind of depending on your audience, you know, um, sometimes people just sort of sit there and stare and sometimes, you know, the hands go right up. But um, what that refers to uh, is this. That is the annual total of uh, shipping at sea in any given year, uh, 11 billion tons. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's another way of saying that is virtually anything that we use or make or touch as people uh, spends at least part of its life uh, at sea on a ship. Um, and, uh, of course, at this these days, uh, we don't even hardly need ships anymore because we can see there are so many at sea now. You can just walk across the ocean from one to the next. Um, and this is a uh, this is a great site called marinetraffic.com. It's a live display of uh, it's a technology called AIS uh, that allows ships at sea to transmit. It's actually mandatory for commercial ships to uh, to transmit their positions. Uh, and you can log on here. And this is actually uh, um, full disclosure. I actually made this slide uh, several months ago. Uh, but you could log in on any day and pretty much see something like this. You, the ocean is just covered with ships, um, and uh, you know there's a there's more ships at sea now than there ever have been. Uh, more mariners, uh, more professional mariners work and more more ship tonnage than there ever has been. So, you know, sometimes people tend to, re you know, regard the maritime profession as a historical one. and certainly has been, uh, but but very, very much alive and still going in new directions. Um, and uh, it's true, right? The truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, I did write a book uh, and, uh, you know, I'll start with disclaimers. Well, it is a book about is a book about sailing and, and weather and uh, history, I guess. And, uh, you know, like I said, start with the disclaimers. I guess I am a mariner, um, but I'm not a meteorologist. And uh, I didn't really think that I was an author either. But but there I went writing a book. Um, and uh, I guess the first question is sort of why. And I think, you know, like Brian said, I've always enjoyed looking for explanations uh, to things. Um, I think it was really largely self-serving. I think if you require simple explanations yourself, you spend a lot of time figuring out how to craft things so you can sort of explain things to yourself. Um, and uh, I've always been interested in science and was always uh, been really fascinated by uh, other people who could tell stories about um, about scientific topics in in plain language uh, and, you know, in a way that was sort of rich with examples. Um, and um, certainly going to see, uh, you know, gives you a lot of time to read books. And the other thing about uh, spending time at sea is you realize the maritime environment is really, uh, even if you're in the commercial, purely commercial side of the industry, um, it's very much about teaching. I think that, um, you know, mariners themselves are, are virtually all teachers. It's sort of the ultimate on the job training environment. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot you can learn things ashore, but really you have to go to sea and learn uh, yeah. partly from the ship and the environment, but also from one another. So really the the most skilled mariners, and I've had the good fortune to sail with quite a few, um, are also really good teachers and explainers because it's really a place, you know, it's, you can never stop learning about uh, what you're doing. Um, and uh, certainly at, at Maine Maritime Academy, the uh, the teaching staff there is largely comprised of, uh, you know, professional mariners, 
Um, and uh, they've really got a fairly limited sort of onboarding program for teachers. Most of them just sort of step in and tar start teaching. Um, and they're all pretty good at it. And I think that's sort of evidence that in the sort of the marine environment, like I said, it's, it's really an environment of, of teaching as much as it is as doing. You really can't ever have a crew that knows too much. So, yeah, the book is about weather and it's kind of knitted together. Um, you know, there's some science in it. Um, there's some, you know, a few sea stories to kind of, you know, knit things together. And sort of in, in researching the book and in doing some of my own reading about weather, I really became fascinated with the development of it as a science. And those three elements sort of, uh, you know, ran together to produce the book. It's not a, uh, you know, when I, I began looking around um, at other books that were out there, some great weather textbooks. Um, and there are some certainly great sea stories about um, you know, epic storms, uh, but I really couldn't find a book that just sort of tried to tell the complete story of weather um, based on its relatively recent history as a science and um, sort of the historic interaction of, of mariners with, with the atmosphere. So what I'm going to do is I just, uh, you know, sort of talk our way through some basics of meteorology, uh, kind of in the way that the book does, and um, also some of the, you know, just to scratch the surface of uh, some of the some of the historical um, yeah historical epochs that you know the weather has shaped right the lives and uh, you know what, what we know about former seafarers um, and how they're connected to um, to weather and to their own meteorology. So to start with, um, as I always tell students, kind of on the first or second day of class, most of the weather uh, weather happens in the atmosphere, but it actually happens in this very 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 thin layer of the atmosphere. Um, you know, if you think our uh, atmosphere is small. Uh, recognize that most weather, most of the air that we breathe, uh, nearly all of the water vapor um, is uh, within the, the lower, uh, the, the lower thinnest region of the atmosphere called the troposphere. It's a region that's between eight and 10 or eight and 12 miles thick, um, crowded right up against the Earth's surface. And, um, you know, one of the most memorable descriptions of it that I've run across came from an astronaut, a woman by the name of Sally Ride, uh, who, while on her space shuttle flight in, in 1993, um, compared it to the the fuzz on a tennis ball. Okay, so just this, you know, very very thin layer, uh, but that's where all our our weather actually happens. Um, the uh, next question uh, is is what is weather? Um, and it's actually the uh, the most eloquent um, description of weather I've ever come across uh, came from somebody named that I know named Finn Perry. Maybe some of you know him. He's a he's a great sailor. He's done all kinds of stuff, and actually also a very talented writer. Um, and uh, he's done some writing for Wooden Boat and was, uh, you know, gracious enough to review this book for that magazine. But, you know, um, unfortunately, I, I didn't hear him say this until after I had written the book, so I didn't get to put it in the book. I uh, wish I had. But he said, weather is simply the first law of thermodynamics uh, influenced by the Coriolis effect. Um, and uh, first law of thermodynamics, uh, for those of you who, who don't have it on the top of your heads, it's the uh, saying that... Uh, Energy in a system can can change form, but it can't be created or destroyed. Um, it's sort of if you have a system, you know, the energy stays in it even if it if it changes from one form to another. Um, and uh, the other part of that is the the Coriolis effect, and that's just as we see here in this example. Um, you know, this rotating low pressure system in the North Atlantic, actually quite a bit like the storm that's headed our way here in a, in a day or two. Um, we can see that. You know, this is wind blowing in towards an area of low pressure, but the wind, instead of blowing straight in, um, it's cycling, right? It's a cyclone. It's a counterclockwise rotation of wind around a, a low pressure system. Um, and um, the reason the wind does that, it deflects, uh, uh, is because it's, the Earth is rotating. So the Earth's rotating frame of reference makes, you know, things moving through the atmosphere like, like wind appear to take on a curved path. So that's, that's the Coriolis effect uh, or, or the Coriolis force, if you like. Um, sort of more first principles of weather. Uh, we, uh, you know, the general properties of air, the atmosphere is made up of air. It's a gas. It's a mostly nitrogen, um, some oxygen, a little bit of water vapor. Um, and uh, we hear a lot about CO2, but there's actually very little of it actually there. Um, but at any rate, uh, being a gas, when, uh, you know, when air is warmer, it becomes less dense um, and tends to rise as it's displaced by uh, colder, denser uh, air. Um, and that's really what weather is. The earth receives its thermal energy from the sun uh, and absorbs that energy. It gives it back to the atmosphere. Um, and uh, like so many systems, things aren't equal for everyone. The, uh, the tropics get much more energy from the sun than the higher latitudes do. 
um, and weather is just sort of the endless process of that trying to sort itself out. Um, and um, sort of anywhere you look, whether you're looking at a global scale or just locally, um, air that is uh, air that is warmer, uh, that's absorbed more thermal energy is going to be less dense and is going to tend to rise uh, and it's going to tend to be displaced by colder air that's sinking. Um, and in the process, uh, as air rises, warm air rises, uh, the pressure at the surface underneath it drops, and that's why we tend to we you know, tend to describe these as as low pressure regions, um, and we tend to associate them with a cyclonic, a counterclockwise flow of air, and that's just as again the air flows in towards the center, uh, it's deflected in the northern hemisphere, it turns right on its way in, uh, so we wind up with this uh, counterclockwise spiral of of air, also known as wind, around a low pressure system. Um, another typical feature of low pressure systems is that air is lifted, um, it cools, uh, and any moisture that it's carrying um, <clears throat> as water vapor tends to be condensed. So that's what yields clouds and eventually precipitation. Um, conversely, you know, colder air uh, is denser and tends to sink um, in the presence of warm air around it. And uh, as it sinks, sinks and spreads out, um, again, it turns right on its way out. And so High pressure systems uh, in the northern hemisphere are indicated by areas where uh, air is flowing uh, clockwise around them. Like I say, if you go to New Zealand, <clears throat> as I had to do on a job um, seven or eight years ago, you got to throw away everything you knew and start again. Uh, it's like switching to your metric toolbox, but uh, the principles are the same. Okay, just a little bit more science class here. Um, the uh, you know thing that we think of as wind is just air flowing from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure, um, and uh, you know wind uh, wind flows from higher pressure towards lower pressure, and the rate at which pressure changes, uh, the so-called gradient, is going to determine how quickly um, the wind is going to move. So it's really just like pointing your skis down a mountain, um, and uh, you know on a a hiking map, right? The changes in altitude would be indicated by contour lines, and on a weather map. Um, the changes in atmospheric pressure are indicated by these lines called isobars. And uh, just like pointing your, pointing your skis down a mountain, the closer together the lines are, the faster you're going to go. So pretty much the same thing with uh, high and low pressure systems. And if you look at a weather map, uh, any sort of feature that has closely spaced isobars around it um, is going to generate um, is going to generate more wind. OK, so that's, you know, again, I'm talking to students about how to read weather maps. Um, it's one of the first things you, you direct them towards. So, as I said, we can look at that and on virtually almost any scale, whether it's sort of scalable, you can look at the thunderstorm happening, uh, you know, out on the bay, or you can look at weather and so a global, um, on a global scale. And the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the same processes are at work. There's a, you know, warmer air is rising off the surface and cold air is flowing in to replace it. Um, and uh, these next two slides um, sort of take us on a tour of that. Um, this is the sailor's ocean. Sailors don't really care what's going on on land, right, as far as the weather goes. And uh, if you don't believe that, you know, look at a marine weather map and um, there's nothing, nothing on land. It's as though all the land and cities don't exist, which I've always found kind of amusing. But here at sea, um, these are the uh, these are the so-called global wind belts, the sort of average, uh, average flow of wind across the planet. Um, this is probably a review or you know, old news for many of you with sailing backgrounds, but the, uh, the the most conspicuous and um, and um, consistent wind belt is the uh, so-called trade winds in the tropics, and these are easterly winds, uh, you know, sort of warm easterly winds um, that develop as uh, warm air rises off the equator uh, and air flows in from either direction to replace it, and that with the uh, combined with the Coriolis effect uh, gives a very very consistent, very steady uh, flow out of the east and named the trade winds because they were useful, right? If you trade, if you needed to travel someplace um, for uh, purposes of trade, uh, as long as you didn't mind going west, right? The winds in the tropics were, were very reliable. Um, and if you got up into our latitudes, uh, you know, we're about, uh, about halfway to the North Pole. We're about halfway from the pole to the equator. I think, um, you know, the latitude of Camden is around 44 degrees. Uh, there's towns kind of scattered across the state that, you know, their sole distinction is that they're exactly halfway between, you know, they're right on the 45th parallel of latitude. Uh, sorry, Bingham, uh, but they're, uh, you know, just about exactly between the equator and the pole. But anyway, in our latitudes, um, you know, most of the wind that we get is out of the west. And you sort of think about that. 
and I say most, but you start to think about day to day, you know, if you measure the wind direction, you know, where's the wind? Well, it's, you know, southwest, it's northwest, it's southwest, it's northwest. Occasionally we get some easterly, right? We get northeasterlies, but for the most part, on average, um, you know, most of the wind we get in what I'm going to call the middle latitudes is, is out of the west. Um, and then if you go far enough north um, into the higher latitudes, so, you know, near the poles, really in either hemisphere, um, you get into another band of easterlies and they're nowhere near as warm and they're not as reliable um, as the easterly trade winds. Um, but they're, they're consistent enough to be, uh, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to average out the general way that the wind blows um, in, in that part of the globe, uh, it's going to be out of the east. <clears throat> so, Sometimes uh, this is drawn, so that's the map spread out flat. Um, and uh, if you crack open an earth science textbook, you might run across a, uh, you know, very interesting drawing that sort of demonstrates this in cross section, right? We see that, you know, in the, uh, the tropics near the trade wind belt, um, war air is warmed and lifted off the, out of the tropics, the warmest part of the planet, the warmest part of the atmosphere. Um, it's lifted off the surface and air flows in from either direction to replace it, right? And that's the, uh, the trade wind belt, generally easterly. Now, if we go a little farther north, uh, we find some of that air is sinking back towards the surface, right? So if uh, anybody's heard of the Bermuda High, uh, Bermuda High pressure system, um, or, uh, or been to Death Valley for that matter, uh, these are both places where, uh, you know, air that's been lifted up out of the tropics is sinking back to the surface. Um, and that air spreads out. Some of it makes its way back towards the trade wind belt. Um, some of it makes its way back up to the north um, and uh, actually begins to mix it up with very cold air that's drifting down out of the polar regions. And that's really, that process is what really stirs weather up in our latitudes. Most of the wind that we see um, in, in our latitudes is actually the result of, of low pressure systems that develop here sort of at the uh, the meeting point between this sort of warmer air from down south and the, the colder air from um, the Arctic regions. So I think the best way to look at that in detail is to look at, you know, how some people across history um, have uh, have made use of this. Um, and uh, this is a, a very incomplete list, I think, of voyages across time. But, um, you know, we'll start off in the Atlantic. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, you know, the first European uh, navigators in the North Atlantic, starting with the Norse, uh, sometimes referred to as the Vikings, right? Uh, you know, what's now Norway, uh, Scandinavia. Um, these folks came to great sailors, still great sailors, and they came to North America in, in open boats um, sometime well, a little more than a thousand years ago, about a thousand AD. Um, and then about 500 years after them, um, you know, the people that we, uh, you know, most directly connect with the age of European navigation, uh, Spanish and Portuguese primarily, um, who crossed the Atlantic from the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and at the same time, and in fact, you know, well before, actually, I mean, these were the, the Europeans, uh, you know, most familiar to us, but they were really the Europeans, were in fact, the, just one of the last cultures to actually, uh, you know, undertake great voyages across the uh, planet's primary oceans. Um, you know, it turned out, and as they discovered, there was a, a long culture of, uh, uh, of trade and travel under sail in the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, primarily sailors from the Arabian Peninsula, but uh, using the monsoon winds in the uh, Indian Ocean. And then, of course, in the Pacific, um, again, a tremendous sailing culture. Uh, you know, I'll talk about this in more detail. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Pacific, by the time the Europeans got there, the Pacific was entirely populated by people who had um, sailed to all these islands, settled them in, in open canoes uh, with their own system of navigation. But um, but anyway, look back to the Atlantic. Um when uh, I was working on Bowdoin a number of years ago, I was lucky enough to go to a, a place to the northern end of the uh, Newfoundland Peninsula called Lanzo Meadows. And uh, in addition to being just a sweet little spot, um, it's uh, now a World Heritage Site, and it's actually the uh, the location of the only confirmed uh, Norse settlement in North America. So the only the only confirmed Norse settlement in North America. There's a couple from Norway, uh, two archaeologists, uh, Annie and Helga Ingsted. Uh, who in the 60s uh, did their original excavations there and determined that there had been a village there uh, for about 100 years, right? So this just wasn't a quick stop and go thing. There had been an established settlement uh, for about 100 years. And, you know, how did they get there? Well, they um, they came over in these boats. Uh, you know, they didn't have color photography back then. So this is actually a reproduction of a, a vessel that was built in Norway about 10 years ago 
uh, to uh, to duplicate some of these voyages, and they were successful. Very very seaworthy boats, uh, sixty or eighty feet long, um, and uh, with banks of oars for when the wind was contrary. And um, you know, as far as they're able to tell, uh, one big square sail. So boats that you know, when you think about a vessel like this for the sailors in the room, uh, very effective at sailing downwind, uh, but maybe not a boat you would want to try to go to windward in. So how did the Norse pull this off? Well, what they did was they took advantage. They obviously had a sophisticated enough. Um, a, you know, sophisticated enough understanding of the weather patterns in the North Atlantic um, to sort of understand what they needed to do. Um, and, you know, their original voyage path right on the, you know, the outbound voyage, um, they needed to go west. So they needed to um, they needed to take advantage of easterly winds, um, which they knew existed in the higher latitudes. So generally their voyages, they would leave. Uh, they would, would leave Norway um, and uh, Iceland's not really on the map here, but would frequently make a stop at Iceland. Uh, and uh, they spent a good bit of time in Greenland, and then ultimately this hop to North America, what was called Vinland um, in their written records, uh, was made, but all sort of propelled by these polar easterlies, which were, were on and off uh, quite reliable. And then when the time came to go back to the east, um, they got further south, okay, sort of into our latitudes where the predominant winds are westerly. So they're really just taking advantage of um, you know, a system in our latitudes. Again, our weather is pretty much governed by this these low pressure systems that move through, um, you know, periodically, depending on the time of year. You know, here this time of year, you know, one or two a week uh, in the summertime, less frequently. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> here's what these systems look like from space. Of course, as far as we know, the, the Norse navigators weren't able to look at them from space. But this is a slide we looked at a little earlier, right? This is a this is a North Atlantic uh, extra tropical cyclone. It's a, a low pressure system. Uh, this picture was actually taken in the winter time. Uh, so very, very much like the system that's headed up the coast towards us. And this is just a, a, a frontal low pressure system, which means it's being formed by uh, the intermixing of warmer air from the you know, southerly latitudes and colder air from the poles. And these things, you know, as they form, um, you know, the deepest area of low pressure is at the center. And the general rotation of wind around these things is counterclockwise. Okay. And so, you know, fairly easy to see with a, you know, a mariner's understanding of these systems. Uh, the Norse navigators, when they wanted to go west, as long as they were stayed north of these systems, they would have a fairly steadily steady supply of easterly winds, you know, easterly wind, northeasterly wind, uh, to take them on their way from Europe towards Greenland and eventually North America. Um, and then when the uh, time came to go home, right? The star is the approximate location of their settlement at Lanso Meadows. And they go south um, and, uh, you know, wait for the wind to shift out of the west uh, and make their way back. And there are, you know, consistent records, artifacts, and now things like, you know, DNA and things like that to prove that these were not, these were not lucky voyages. I'm sure, you know, they weren't easy, but uh, these were repeated voyages. So like we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes about the Polynesians, you know, these people knew how to get from place to place and back again on a reliable basis over, you know, hundreds of years uh, in open boats. So things are a lot easier in the tropics. Uh, and uh, this is actually a, a picture of Corwith Kramer, which we looked at again, one of uh, one of SEA's uh, sailing ships, which I was luck very lucky enough to be uh, the captain of on and off for a number of years. Uh, but, you know, sailing in the tropics, right? Easy living, you've got the trade winds, uh, they blow very consistently out of the east, uh, the weather is warm. Um, and certainly for part of the year, there's a, a certain risk from uh, from tropical cyclones, things like hurricanes. But for the most part, um, you know, as long as you don't mind sailing west, um, it's uh, pretty easy going, particularly for traditionally rigged sailing ships with square sails and, uh, you know, not particularly well adapted to making their way back up to windward. But the, this environment is pretty much ruled by a single, um, you know, tropical air masses. There's no real mixing of air masses. There's just a lot of warm air rising um, and that's why you also get, if you've been there, right, you know, sort of abundant uh, environment of, of warm water and a lot of big, puffy, cumulus clouds, uh, frequent rain, but uh, never of real long duration. <clears throat> so the uh, the first European navigators to take real advantage of the trade winds, uh, like I said, were the Spanish um, and the Portuguese. Um, and uh, they first sort of discovered that they were there by making voyages uh, south out of uh, originally the Mediterranean and then out of uh, Spain, uh, making their way south along the coast of Africa and discovering that there was this very consistent band of, of easterly winds um, that would take you offshore. And I think there was a certain period of experimentation 
um, you know, sailing west was easy, but how did you get home again? And so I think there are probably a number of people who who did not, unfortunately. Um, but and uh, it's not entirely clear who was the first person to pull it off successfully. But uh, these navigators ran across a technique which they came to call the Volta do Mar, which was the uh, return um, return from sea um, in Portuguese. And what they discovered is you could sail west in the trade winds, and then if you took a right and sailed north. Uh, sort of kept the faith if your food and water held out um, and the crew didn't mutiny, you would eventually get yourself back up into these this belt of where the winds were more predominantly westerly, um, and that would carry you back to Europe. And that's the way the uh, the Azores were first discovered. Uh, they actually, as far as anybody can tell, were, were uninhabited until the Portuguese got there um, in the mid-1400s. And then uh, Columbus, on his numerous voyages, uses adaptations of this same technique, sailing Sailing west in the trade winds, and then uh, heading north in the heading north uh, into the westerlies to get back home. And uh, this was a you know we sort of take this for granted, but you sort of think about you know technologies and how they change the time. And this is really um, you know this is like splitting the atom, right? This is a this was a major discovery uh, in the advancement of of navigation and just how humans got uh, distributed around the globe. Um, the next people to capitalize on this uh, were people like, uh, you know, Bartolomeu Diaz, who you may have heard of, or uh, Vasco da Gama. These were, uh, again, you know, Spanish and Portuguese navigators who uh, they sort of bet correctly on the fact that this was not unique to the North Atlantic. This was going on, in fact, in every ocean um, and, uh, you know, in virtually every ocean basin. Um, you're going to have easterly trade winds in the tropics. You're going to have westerly winds kind of in the middle latitudes. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, the first person to actually sail, this is what Columbus was trying to do and actually never figured out, uh, but the first person to actually sail successfully to India from Europe was uh, Vasco da Gama. Um, and he did so right by, you know, again, just sort of, you know, betting correctly that he would be able to find, you know, trade winds in the tropics and westerlies. Um, da Gama sailed almost to Brazil and the trade winds and then back around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and then eventually to India, uh, where he established a, a Portuguese settlement. And uh, it was kind of mind-blowing. I didn't realize this until I started researching the book, but the Portuguese had a presence in India until the early 1960s. And there was actually a short war over the, the settlement of the colony of Goa. Um, and they actually got booted out finally at that point. So this is the beginning of a 500-year presence of uh, you know Western Europeans in India that, uh, that began with these voyages. Um, and a big part of... Uh, of their success was uh, capitalizing on this very well established pattern of navigation that took place in the Indian Ocean, um, taking advantage of this thing called the monsoon, which is like the uh, you know the most giant you know it's like a sea breeze on a continental scale. As the uh, over the course of the year, uh, the Asian continent heated up and cooled off, um, you know, twice a year. The wind switches from onshore and offshore, and these are that's a monsoon wind, um, you know, and it's like. You can get monsoons in, in many different locations, but the biggest one by far was in the Indian Ocean. And it was, uh, you know, there was by the time uh, da Gama got there, you know, for thousands of years, uh, there had been a well-established uh, trade shipping back and forth the uh, back and forth across the Indian Ocean uh, on the monsoon winds between Africa and, uh, and India. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, Magellan was the one uh, is the one who's credited with, as far as anybody knows, uh, undertaking uh, the first successful circumnavigation uh, of the world under sail. Um, and uh, it's a, I would say it is a was a qualified success. Uh, first of all, uh, Magellan never got there. He actually was killed about halfway around uh, in a skirmish with some uh, islanders in the Philippines. Uh, you know, folks who lived there already and and weren't happy to see him. I guess. Um, and uh, the voyage was actually completed by his uh, his chief mate, right? We all rely on our chief mates. And uh, Juan Sebastian del Cano uh, finished the voyage. Uh, and by the time they got back to Spain, uh, they were three years in um, and down to a single ship out of five and only 18 crew out of about 200. So um, it was a, a remarkable discovery, but a, a fairly costly one. But again, just based on a successful realization that you know, the wind system that we connect with the North Atlantic, right, you know, westerlies in the middle latitudes and trade winds in the tropics is something that replicates itself uh, all around the world. So uh, check the time here. The uh, 
monsoons are in the, uh, you know, the system of sailing in the monsoons is, is remarkable enough that I think it you know, observed, you know, deserves kind of an additional mention. Like I say, by the time the Europeans got here, they realized there was this thousands years old trade of shipping back and forth across the Indian Ocean. If we think about it in the summertime, um, you know, on the bay, one of our favorite things is the sea breeze, right? The land heats up and the wind comes in off the bay in the afternoon. Um, and if you can imagine this, and sometimes in the evening things cool off and you might just get, let a nice real light offshore breeze in the evening. If you can think about this happening on a continental scale um, where all of Asia heats up um, and in the summertime, right, you know, one of the hottest places in the world, you know, think about the Gobi Desert, um, all that heats up and the air rises and just the wind floods in off the Indian Ocean of these tremendously strong wet breezes off the Indian Ocean. And then in the wintertime, um, you know, all that switches to being the coldest place in the world. So you get, you know, the Mongolian steppes and the Himalayas and all gets really cold in the wintertime. The air drains off the continent and back across the Indian Ocean. So being able to sail successfully all the wind you wanted. Um, but the key and the key was in understanding, you know, when this happened, having the local knowledge to understand when these systems sort of switched on and off. Um, and the Europeans never would have gotten to India, um, you know, if they hadn't been able to obtain this knowledge. Also interesting is uh, this uh, trade, you know, I'm saying 1000 BC, that's sort of a speculative time for the origin of this. Um, but uh, these, uh, there, was, there was commercial cargo being carried under sail up until the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, there's a great book by... Uh, Alan Villiers uh, called Sons of Sinbad, where he actually went out sailing with some of these people um, right before the Second World War. Uh, but uh, it's kind of an interesting mirror of what was going on, I think, in New England, right? We sort of think of that as the tail end of cargo under sail uh, on this coast as well. And their vessels looked a little bit different, but also uh, equally interesting, right? There's still people sailing around in these boats that, that know how to sail them. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, I didn't get as far as finding out whether they have wind jammers in Madagascar, but wouldn't that be a great thing? And then, uh, you know, finally, we think about, you know, world sailing routes, it's, uh, you know, very hard to ignore the, uh, clipper routes, right? Everybody thinks about, you know, commerce under sail and they think about the, uh, the clipper ships and the grain ships and, um, they were all able to make great progress around, around the world by getting themselves down into what was called the Southern Ocean. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a place where the, we have westerlies down here also, but completely uninhibited by continents. So the wind sort of roars from west to east. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a great way of sailing around the world uh, as long as, you know, all you wanted to do was get back to where you started. So there was this whole generation of ships that were built to survive in those conditions. Um, and, you know, it was an incredible amount of cargo and some great, uh, great sailing accomplishments um, that were, you know, really survived as, as records until very recently and have only really been broken by sort of the latest generation of sailors to, to, to sail in these latitudes, uh, no longer needed by cargo ships, but, uh, you know, now employed by um, endurance racers, you know, in the high performance, uh, you know, various um, circumnavigation races that take place in, in one way or another each year, but same exact same routes, right? They sail south into the Southern Ocean, just go screaming around the world in the uh, the roaring 40s and the furious 50s, right? And just the wind blows out of the West and um, and never stops. So, as far as uh, looking at uh, historical sailing examples, uh, I sort of like to finish up with the. Uh, with the Pacific, um, and uh, you know, we keep talking about you know Europeans uh, getting to these places and and making discoveries, uh, and you know, Magellan spent some time in the Pacific, and uh, Captain Cook famously did, um, you know, a couple hundred years after that. Uh, but the interesting thing is, you know, the when the Europeans got to the Pacific, um, you know, if you look at the Pacific on a map, it looks like it's basically made up entirely of water, uh, but in fact, it's really a sea of islands. They're just hundreds of thousands of islands spread across this whole expanse of ocean. Um, and when the Europeans got there, they were all settled. They all had large, in some cases, very large civilizations on them. Um, and some had for a very long time. Uh, the uh, Tonga, which is uh, about a thousand miles, 1300 miles sort of northeast of New Zealand, um, had been settled since 900 BC, as far as anybody had been able to tell. Samoa, uh, not too far from Tonga. Similarly, uh, there have been people living there for at least 3000 years. Uh, Tahiti, right, relatively new, 1100 AD, right around the time the Norse came to North America. Uh, Rapa Nui, uh, which you might know as Easter Island, uh, 1200 AD. Um, and uh, Hawaii, similarly, uh, was settled by the Polynesians at right around the same time. Uh, and then finally, uh, New Zealand, or Aotearoa, 
uh, which is the indigenous name for this place. And this was uh, the last major landmass on Earth to be settled by uh, humans. And these were uh, Polynesians who were sort of the most famous, but by no means the only one of these uh, Pacific Island sailing cultures who were experts at long distance navigation in open boats uh, using a system of navigation. Again, these are repeatable voyages, right? And we've seen now that we have things like, you know, DNA and carbon dating and things like that. We can see these these people were, were all over the place, maybe even as far east as South America. Um, and they did it in sailing canoes, basically large, uh, mostly open boats. Um, and uh, with, uh, you know, a very sophisticated system of navigation that were really just, you know, people, uh, you know, largely, largely folks from these islands now are working very hard and gradually putting together, you know, um, at least some sense of how this was done, but it was done. It was done over and over again uh, for for thousands of years. Um, and the most interesting thing about this to me, well, it's, it's all interesting, but one of the most captivating things about this to me is to think that um, if you look at the way these civilizations spread from west to east, and then think about this is all in the tropics, and we've just spent a bunch of time talking about the fact that you know the tropics, right? The wind always blows out of the east. So you picture yourself in an open sailing canoe with you know. Your people and your you know your coconuts and your livestock and whatever else you're bringing along to get to the next island um and um you know these were great sailing boats but again they weren't uh you know better when you didn't have to sail to windward and i think that um that's sort of a demonstration that again you know polynesians and the other island sailing cultures had enough of a grasp you know the wind is out of the east in the tropics most of the time but not all the time right so they had enough of a grasp of the subtleties of the meteorology in the tropics that they knew you know, when to take advantage of uh, the variability that was there. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's pretty fascinating. It speaks to their level of, of expertise and, uh, and a study. And then, you know, zooming back to the present, okay? So this is, uh, again, these are sailors in the modern age. So these are, uh, this is data from sailing yachts. And, uh, you know, a little, we talk about the color code here. So all the blue boats are going west. Uh, all the green boats are going east uh, and the red boats are going north and south. And what we can see um, is uh, that, uh, you know, the modern sailing routes uh, are really following the same paths, right? And, you know, again, if there's sailors in the crowd, as I'm sure there are, you know this, right? If you want to get, uh, if you want to get from North America to Europe, you don't do it in the tropics, right? You wait until summer and then you catch a ride on the westerlies uh, across the North Atlantic. Similarly, coming back, um, you know, you want to come back in the tropics so that you can take advantage of the trade winds and similarly across the Pacific. Um, and then, you know, interestingly, you can also from this just sort of see, um, you know, where are the places that people want to go, right? What's here? Well, this is Hawaii, right? So uh, we can see, you know, north-south traffic back and forth between um, between Tahiti uh, and the sort of central Polynesian islands. Um, so these, these routes, uh, you know, very very definitely mimic the routes that have been taken by other sailing cultures for thousands of years. Uh, we can just watch them and record them a little bit more effectively. So um, I've got some time set aside for questions, I hope. Uh, and, uh, you know, what I've done is uh, a little bit preemptively uh, because, you know, so I've given uh, a few discussions based around this book and some other just general talks about weather. And, um, you know, people are always interested in, you know, asking, um, asking mariners, well, can you see the effects, you know, we've um, established now that, you know, certainly over the last half century, uh, there have been some significant changes uh, in the climate, the uh, atmosphere is warming. Um, and, uh, you know, can you see the effects of that uh, and the weather that you see? Um, and, you know, I think the, the response is really, uh, you know, I think to mariners, and I, I say this in the book, but I think, uh, you know, to mariners really you're dealing whether it's a day-to-day -day thing, right? So you're sort of a one storm at a time approach. And it's very hard to say that, um, you know, what you're dealing with on any given day is the result of climate change, right? Um, you know, it's just it's just the weather that you have that day. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, if you talk to weather forecasters, right, the big people who are in the business, the, you know, incredible scientists who are in the business of telling us, giving us their best, uh, their best estimation of what the weather is going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, they kind of have the same answer, right? That, you know, it's, it's difficult um, in short-term patterns to sort of integrate out, you know, a long-term trend to find out what the actual signal is. But um, climatologists who are working on this have some have some pretty significant data, right? This is a, a, um, a thermal image of the planet actually stretching between uh, 1979 and 2004. So this is a 25 year period. Uh, and what this is showing is just uh, how much the how much temperatures have warmed, average temperatures have warmed when compared to the previous 25 years. 
Um, and, uh, you know, don't worry too much about the units, right? But just uh, the uh, red is warmer, right? And the areas that are red, um, most notably the Arctic regions, um, have on average have warmed as much as five or six degrees Celsius when compared to the preceding 25 years. Um, and it's a uh, very, very hard to find any place on the planet that has not warmed. And in fact, the uh, sort of the planetary average over this period um, is about a degree Celsius, which again, doesn't sound much, right? It's not really going to make a difference between whether you put your hat on or not. But, um, you know, if you think about globally, if you think about the amount of actual heat energy this evolves, um, it's, it's really tremendous. So, you know, how is this, how is this affecting weather? Well, here's some information. Um, and uh, I've got um, a bunch of this is a, a climate scientist at, uh, at MIT named Kerry Emanuel, who's done a lot of work on uh, um, the connections between the warming atmosphere and, um, and tropical cyclones. Um, but, um, you know, from uh, some of the papers he's published, um, you know, and this is this is information, general information you can find um, in, uh, you know, from a lot of sources. But uh, the last 15 years uh, have been the 15 warmest in recorded history. Um, and uh, that that warming's not happening uniformly, uh, but that it's happening uh, most distinctly at the poles, and particularly in the Arctic uh, versus the Antarctic, but at, at both poles. Um, and what that means is the sort of um, the traditional, we think of the traditional boundaries between climate zones um, are perhaps not as stable and not as consistently in the same locations um, as they have been historically. Um, also significant is most of that heat's getting soaked up by the oceans. About 90% of the excess heat that we've absorbed over the last half century um, has been absorbed by the oceans. Water has a much higher heat capacity than terrain does. Um, and uh, as a result, the oceans are uh, just about a degree warmer, 0 0.8 degrees Celsius, um, which are those uh, you know European or scientific degrees. Um, and uh, so the last century, right, the oceans have warmed up just shy of one degree Celsius, which, again, doesn't sound like much. But when you look at the actual energy, uh, it's yeah, it's a ridiculous amount of, of energy. Um, and as far as real effects, um, this has uh, as the oceans are warmer. There's more water vapor rising off the oceans. This means there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, and water vapor is really what fuels uh really what fuels low pressure systems. They get their energy by sort of lifting water vapor up into the atmosphere, um, condensing it into liquid and uh, the heat gets released in that process. And um, so that six degree increase in available water vapor, uh, according to Kerry Emanuel, has led to um, the theoretical maximum, um, you know, tropical cyclones now um, are 20, have the potential to be 25 knots more powerful. It's about a 15, 15% increase in average strength since the beginning of this period. Um, and then finally, uh, just kind of looking at our own recent past, right? If we want to look at the, uh, you know, the, the last 10, uh, you know, record tropical cyclone seasons, uh, six of those have happened in the last 20 years. Um, and uh, eight of them have happened in the last 30 years. So I'm having a little trouble here with this little window with all the people in it. Here we go. So, so this is the, uh, map from 2020. This is the uh, 2020 um, hurricane season. Uh, they were nice enough mostly to miss Maine, uh, but, uh, you know, very significantly it's the year of, uh, well, you know, too many storms to name from memory, right? But 30 storms is more than anybody else had ever seen. Uh, but this was broken in 2021. Okay. So 2021 was another record year. Um, and, uh, you know, so the answer to, uh, you know, is, uh, is our, our changes is the warming planet influencing weather you know it's almost certainly uh but like i say those of us sort of live in the day-to-day -day, right you can't provide a definitive answer to that except to say probably right you know by the middle of this century um this map is probably going to look a little bit different or certainly where you know we're used to seeing the we're used to putting the arrows um uh, you know they may not be in exactly the same place as they were when this map was was originally drafted so that's me hopefully heading off the climate question, but I'm uh, happy to elaborate if anybody has more questions. So I'll, I'll wrap up there uh, and uh, we'll say uh, thank you again to, uh, to Jim and, and Robin and to Brian for that great introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming. I have one little question, Elliot, if, if I can interrupt. Of course. Well, I, um, you said in your book that uh, that phenomenal voyage that the flying cloud, Donald McKay's flying cloud, went from Cape Horn to California in 1849-50, uh, and uh, in 190 days, 89 days, 
And that record has stood until, I think you said, 1985 or 80-something, 80 86. Who, yeah, that's... that's who, who equaled that or beat that record? Oh, you know, I don't have that. I don't have that on top of my head. You know, it was somebody in a, you know, in a crazy high performance. I'm not even sure if it was a mono hull or a, a multi hull. Uh, it might have been, a, it might have been a boat called Jet Services, but I would have to go back. Uh, you know, so I think it was a high performance multi hull uh, that yeah. broke that record. Yeah. 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 D different yeah. kind of orange. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hey, thank you. I'm glad I Certainly. asked the yeah. question at least you hesitated on. <laughs> You had so many of the great answers here. Uh, any yeah. other any, any other questions? Speak up. Well, does anybody know how to how to unmute yourself? If you look at your your picture here, you should be able to find your picture in the upper right hand corner. You'll see a little button that says unmute. There's anybody that has a question. No, that's one just because you you speak a lot about the way we, the weather is changing and has changed lately. And in your book, you write a lot about the way our ability to predict the weather and to understand the weather has changed um, from single station reporting and forecasting to modern modeling. Where do you think our do you have any idea how our ability to understand the weather and the tools that we have? are changing and will change in the not too distant future. So what, what can we look forward to in our ability to understand the weather? Uh, right, that's that's an interesting question. Um, a couple of things, like if you look at, you know, modeling is one great example. These are sort of mathematical, you know, mathematical models uh, that are used to, you know, predict the future of weather systems and, uh, you know, the incredible increase in, in uh, computing power means now it's possible to do much more math faster. So. Um, and the models themselves have gotten more sophisticated. So now kind of if you just look at, um, you know, if you've been downloading uh, or, you know, reading map weather maps for a while, I mean, now there's a, uh, you know, you can get a 96 hour, a four day weather forecast map. Um, that's not a product that's always been available. So the, you know, the reach out into the future of the forecasts, um, you know, has gone from, you know, two or three days just over the last several decades, right from two or three days to now, you know, a, a four or five day forecast um, can be seen as as pretty reliable. Um, it's interesting though, is uh, you know there was uh, the uh, um, the uh, you know original sort of estimation of uh, the uh, the accuracy of models was sort of originally uh, you know seen as you know about about two weeks in forecasting in terms of the sort of limits of the math. Um, and it does seem like there's a little bit of, you know, they're approaching like the, the models will continue to improve, uh, but but not in, indefinitely. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting in, in terms of forecasting um, is the way that uh, information is being handled. And uh, they're looking at that was just a, um, at a conference last week, actually, when some uh, some folks from the Ocean Prediction Center were talking about sort of their own plans. It's so much easier to get data to ships now um, and that they're looking at ways to get. Uh, to get information to vessels in a more usable way. Um, so in terms of instead of just presenting static maps, actually giving them, um, you know, more more dynamic information about sort of what they can expect for weather along a given route, uh, if that makes sense. So I think that's the that's one of the biggest, uh, as, as well as the forecasting models, just the ability to get information to ships has, has been a real game changer. I have a question, please. Go ahead, Keith. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Great program. Um, I don't know very much about meteorology or the weather patterns, but I learned a lot tonight. Just puts the context to what I've studied on some of the uh, trade and shipping history, you know, over the years, particularly how I think there was reference to 800 BC and 900 BC and Tonga and all that. And I read the story of the uh, discovery of those ancient Inca and Mayan big marines in those areas. So it's just very fascinating to me. But I was wondering from a more current point of view and looking at the technology that's available, which you referred to a lot, um, <clears throat> much of what's been done is modeling and the statistics are, you know, it, it, trying to predict what's going to happen with, you know, it, it, innumerable vari variations involved or variables involved. Do you envision a role for um, AI, artificial intelligence in some capacity 
on this, or do you think that um, navigating the seas and reading the weather is really only something that can be done real time? Do you, I'm just kind of curious. I know it's a broad question, but um, anyway. yeah, that's that's a little bit out of my lane. I feel like I think that certainly, uh, you know, our ability to process information and perhaps to you know predict information, uh, you know, AI or whatever, you know, however you want to, whatever title you want to use, I think that's certainly going to um, that's, that's certainly going to be a factor. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, weather, weather forecasting and model itself is modeling itself is sort of a form of, of simulation, right? You know, they use models to sort of predict a series of potential futures. And then, um, you know, if, it's also important to emphasize that forecasting is not just modeling. Uh, and it's uh, as actually as, you know, in practice, it's actually very easy now to get model data and maps that are drawn by models, but to remember what an important role the actual humans play in the process. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think both through both through operating ships offshore and then getting to spend some time, you know, at various weather offices and understanding how important um, forecasters really are. What they really do is um, they sort of assimilate live data. A lot of a large part of their function is figuring out, um, you know, where and when the models make sense and which which models to uh, which models to to emphasize or or to pick. Right. So, and a lot of that is based on. Uh, a lot of that is based on, you know, data that they get from ships. One of the first things, you know, a, a meteorologist finds out that you're, you know, work on a ship. One of the first things they ask you is, oh, do you report weather data? Right. Um, you know, and they're pretty, uh, pretty upfront about that, pretty blunt about that. Uh, so I think that uh, I, I can easily see, right, our ability to, to simulate, uh, to create simulations uh, certainly will be an expanding part of the process. But it's also uh, the more you learn about what the humans do, uh, the you know, it becomes harder to think that they'll ever be, uh, they'll ever be less important. Thank you. I don't know if I answered your question or evaded it, but those are my you thoughts. Did. You, kind of, you kind, of, yeah. kind of validated what I was thinking is, yeah. you know, it's artificial intelligence, everybody kind of doesn't really understand what that means. It's, it's you know, but what we we're doing here is modeling and data and statistics and trying predictive analysis to some extent, which, you know, you can have all the data in the world, but if you don't have the human eyes that are, analyzing and trying to figure out what it is you're trying to prove uh, the data is pretty meaningless so you know right I, and that's I, that's sort of something to keep in mind when, when you're using weather information you know maybe to do your own voyage planning or something like that to recognize that you know anything from a sanctioned weather service you know like the national weather service in the u.s or you know that's that's information that's actually been interpreted by forecasters whereas you know the weather app on your phone you know it might be or it may not it may just be model data that hasn't really been uh you know, that ha really hasn't been viewed or interpreted, so. All right. Thank you. Certainly. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Elliot. That was really fascinating. Yes, well, thank you, Elliot. Certainly, yeah, uh, thank you. So, thank you so much for the... Uh, invitation and if anybody you know has questions down the line i'm relatively easy to find you can just look me up on the main maritime academy web page and so uh, you know always happy always happy to hear from people and uh great to see the faces in the room that i recognize hopefully we can cross paths in person before too long come have a party down at the Mer sail power and steam museum oh what a great <laughs> idea <laughs> you know listen with all this information i want to run out and buy another boat now but my wife yeah. will... oh be careful yeah, it's a slippery <laughs> slope <right? laughs> well the weather well, one thing about the weather is it's, it's going to change no matter what we do it's going to change and let's just hope it changes for the better well i thank you all very much for coming this is our 27th <clears throat> 27th <clears throat> captain's quarters presentation Here's just a little look astern at uh, all the different ones we've done all the way down through, my gosh, uh, from the Arctic schooner Bowden all the way down to tugbo uh, tugboats and schooner cooks and morning in Maine and square rigger captains and pilots of the Penobscot. Captain Jack Kroll, incredible Captain Jack Kroll, and it took the Gertrude Tier Wheel North and got into all kinds of trouble with it. Lots and lots of these are all on our website. So if you are curious about it, go to our website and look up captain's quarters and you can check out all of these different vessels here's what's coming up ahead captain's quarters <clears throat> of course we've done 
the story of the Portland Gail with Don Wilding, Wilding and uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And now the reading of the glass. Get, get a copy of that book. That's a fascinating book. And Ellie does such a great job of it. So we have these others, February 26th, March 11th, March 18th. Look at it. Put it on your refrigerator and tune in so that you uh, don't miss any of the coming up uh, attractions in Captain's Quarters. But if you get bored and you don't have anything else to do, I shouldn't say that. Put this up on high on your list as well. This is a, a book called Reckless, Reckless Abandon. It's my memoirs, 40 years of voyaging, tugboats, freight boats, and, of course, my great big schooner, the old adventure 122-foot Gloucester fishing schooner. <clears throat> Fabulous vessel. Tells all about the makes, mistakes I've made over the last 40 years. And these are my memoirs, and, you know, some of it's probably even true. You'll have to read it and find out. Don't forget us. Don't forget us. Put put these kids out on the <clears throat> on the water, and uh, <clears throat> uh, remember we couldn't do it without you. And we certainly do thank you. Any donation is most gratefully received. Don't forget the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum. I'll see you in Rockland. Come into Rockland, South End of Rockland. I'll give you a thirty cent tour of the museum. I'm Captain Jim Sharp signing off. Any other questions you may have, jump right in. Speak right up now. This is your last chance. No more comments? Well, I'll say something. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, uh, for hosting, and uh, look forward to seeing you all sometime. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you all soon. Great. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone.